Hey guys, this is CIT 225. Um, we are setting a course which is Network Security and Penetration Testing. And uh, the book we are covering is Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigations. Um, it's a course where we are trying to learn about network security and forensics. Um, again, a disclaimer, whatever we are studying in this course is uh, purely for academic purposes. If you will use it, anything other than academic purposes, you are solely responsible for your own actions. Uh, the material that we are going to cover today is uh, data acquisition. Um, how can we um, extract the data in, in case uh, you found an evidence and uh, uh, a computer was infected or uh, uh, someone tried to penetrate in the hard drive or anything. So what are the ways through which or the tools through which um, you can uh, acquire the data or do the data acquisition. Uh, so in this chapter the objective is list digital evidences and the storage formats. What are the different formats of the storage um, and uh, uh, file systems. Explain ways to uh, determine the best acquisition method which is out there then describe the contingency plan for data acquisition um, what should be the options if uh, you want to recover the data uh, whether you should maintain a single copy or you should maintain multiple copies uh, for the uh, data acquisition uh, then explain uh, how to use the acquisition tools there are lots of tools available out there some are there for domestic use some are there for professional use and uh, we'll be focusing on the tools which are used by the organizations or the labs, forensic labs, uh, uh, the softwares which are used. Uh, most of them are free but some are there which are quite expensive but uh, they are totally worth it uh, because of the output and the speed of the data recovery which is there. Then we'll be talking about how can we validate the data acquisition. Uh, the biggest problem after that is like how can we uh, recover the data from the RAID controllers. Now you know that in RAID um, we are utilizing the storage which is part of a big pool of the hard disk or the storage which is there. So uh, it's not like a physical disk which we can dismount and attach it to our computer to recover the data. It would be a shared pool and from that shared pool you need to get the data out in terms of um, matching all the hashes and all the data which was ever written and deleted from those sectors. So we learned that how can we handle that and we'll explain how to use remote network acquisition tools as well. Now you must have uh, a clear um, you must inform the users on the network uh, in writing or clearly that um, anything which is stored on these machines is a property of the organization and uh, we will penetrate on the hard drives or remotely for data acquisition or anything if we feel like uh, so that uh, when they are trying to uh, do the data acquisition on remote network computers the user will not be aware of and some of the cases uh, uh, the user must not be informed uh, because it would affect the investigation process. So there are tools with the help of which we can uh, um, try to uh, acquire the data from the remote computers and uh, then we list other forensic tools which are available for data acquisition. Now we'll understand the storage formats of digital evidence. Data in the um, um, usually in the storage mediums is stored in a um, when we are taking a backup in form of an image. Um, it has three formats uh, as your book is mentioning. One is raw format, uh, then proprietary format, and then the advanced forensics format, which is uh, quite heavily used when we are um, discussing about the uh, forensics investigation. Uh, raw format is uh, there is only one practical way of copying the data for the purpose of evidence that is preservation and examination of the data. Um, we are uh, copying the data so that we can preserve it and we can use it over the longer period of time. Now we covered in chapter number one that we will have to make sure that the main data has not been altered in any way. So that brings us to a point that uh, whatever we are doing or whatever way we are acquiring the image of the hard drive 
it should be 100% replica of the infected hard drive. Now advantages is, is fast data transfer, it ignores the minor data read errors and the most computer forensic tools can read the raw format of the data. Now <clears throat> let's understand why they are talking about ignore minor data read errors from the source hard drive. The more sophisticated is the, is the software, the better is the copy or the image of the hard drive. Now there is a threshold or um, a limit uh, for the retries if the data is not in 100% readable format. Some software tries it for X number of times, some software tries it for XX number of times means that some software tries it for a couple of times, some will keep on trying it unless they'll get some copy of it uh, from the infected hard drive. Now the number of tries you are making on a hard drive in order to acquire that data takes time. And if it's taking a time and if you have huge hard drives, of course it's going to take a lot of time in order to read that data. That's why we discussed in our previous lecture that we'll have to make sure that the data we are trying to acquire from the hard drive, whether we need all the Word documents, Excel sheets, PDF documents, images, and etc., or you'll have to list down that actually what kind of data are you interested in. I showed you an example, a live example of an infected server where we had an issue of a web shell drop on, the, um, on IIS. We found out the exact format on which the penetrator was acting on, like he was using an ASP file in order to penetrate to the server and run the commands uh, remotely. Now since we had that, we, we understood kind of a pattern that he was following. So what we would do is that we would run or we will try our best to find any ASP or dot executable or bat files or anything which is related to this scenario will be recovered only. Rest of the documents, you can ignore it. Now, it's not like when you are creating a backup image, you decide these things. You decide these things when you are trying to acquire the data from the hard drive. Initially, when you are creating the backup of the hard drive, which is infected or affected, you'll create a complete backup as close 100% possible as you can using a multiple softwares, but making sure that you are not altering the uh, contents of the hard drive, which is infected. Now the disadvantage requires as much storage as the original disk data or tools might not collect the marginal bad sectors which were there, but it would keep on trying to find as much data as possible. Now proprietary formats, most forensics tools have their own formats. Most commercial forensic softwares have their own formats for collecting the digital evidence. Uh, proprietary formats typically offer several features that complement the vendor's analysis tools, such as the option to compress or not to compress the image. Uh, practically speaking, whenever I am there and I am on the investigation part or a part of the team, uh, I try not to compress the files. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, I'm not comfortable with that. Second thing is, if you are compressing the file, it takes more time. If you will decompress it, again it will take more time to decompress it. And I am with the understanding that if I am compressing it and decompressing it, I don't want to play with the contents on the hard drive. So I want to keep them intact in the original format as possible. I don't mind uh, uh, deputing my resources in terms of the storage. We have enough storage available to be utilized for these kind of purposes. But it really depends on the scenario and the kind of storage medium that you have when you are investigating these kind of things. So these kind of limitations should not be there when you are part of any investigation team where you'll have to compromise on the storage or anything like that. You must have enough storage and tools available plus workstations having the same softwares installed with different versions 32-bit and 64-bit uh, from different range of operating system. You never know that what kind of attack was it and it was actually targeting at what kind of operating systems.
Now, try to understand one more thing that in organizations like uh, um, uh, big companies, we try to limit the operating system for the clients to a uh, single operating system. Means that if we are upgrading the network or if we have acquired the license for the latest operating system, we try to make sure that all systems in the organization must have the same operating system installed on their machines. Now the reason behind that is that we don't have to um, uh, keep a big library containing all the different tools which are compatible with other operating systems as well. If we have one operating system which is being used in the organization, we'll focus on the tools which are dedicated for that. So that helps us a little bit towards the investigation. So uh, it saves our time. We don't have to um, spend a lot of time by checking it on cro cross platform applications which are available out there. Now it can split an um, image into smaller segments. Again, I don't do that. I uh, try to have the maximum everything uh, being restored on a big medium. And uh, we discussed it in our first chapter as well that for example, if your initial hard drive um, which was affected was of 500 GB, um, the data or the external hard drive on which you would be recovering the data should be more than one terabyte. So that whatever was there on the older hard drive, you don't have to compromise about anything. Each and every bit of it is saved on your external disk. You can integrate the metadata into the image file. Metadata is the data about the data. Now that sounds strange. For uh, You might have seen the HTML pages. There is a metadata on the top of the page which is talking about the information which is inside that page or the information about the code and stuff, whatever you are trying to do. So every hard disk, every system like that, they have a metadata of its own, which should be preserved and managed. And then we discussed that if you are recovering it on external hard drive, make sure that the hard drive model and everything is matching to have the exact replica of the hard disk, which is being affected. Now, disadvantage is, is inability to share an image between different tools. If you're using one tool and it's not compatible with the other one, you won't be able to uh, transfer the image. The file size limitations of each segment volume. Some tools are there which can um, recover the data uh, depending on the size of the data recovery or the formats and stuff. So you'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, the expert witness comparison format is an unofficial standard um, which was used earlier but we have advanced forensics format which we are going to talk about which was introduced um, for the purpose um, of the investigation by Dr. Simons developed an own open source um, um, acquisition format called the advanced forensics format this format has the following goals which are mentioned here. Provide the compressed and uncompressed image files. Depends whatever you're trying to do. Provide a space in the image, file format, segmented files, and the metadata. And then simple design with extensibility where you can extend it to multiple volumes. Open source for multiple platforms. So it's not limited to Windows, Linux, or Unix, or any other uh, specific operating system. It should work on cross-platform. Whenever we are talking about cross-platform, we are talking about that if it's Windows, it should be talking to Linux. If it's in Linux, it should be talking to Mac, and etc. So it has the capability to deal in any kind of circumstances. Now file extensions include AFT, which is recognized by all operating system and AFF is an open source system. Next, we are talking about determining the best acquisition method. Now, types of the acquisition are static acquisitions and live acquisitions. Four methods of data collection are there, as mentioned in your book. Um, they're saying that there are two types of acquisitions, static and live. Typically, a static acquisition is done on a computer seized during the pull thread. Okay, for example, if a computer has an encrypted hard drive, a live acquisition is done if a password or passphrase is available. So that means that if the hard drive is encrypted and you know, if you will shut down the computer, what's going to happen is its hash code would change. So it would have a next new encryption algorithm on it. So in order to protect that, 
the it's not like whenever you find a computer which is affected or infected uh, you'll simply shut it down and take it home with you and try the and start the investigation process you'll have to note down what's going on and if it's an encrypted hard drive you'll have to do the live acquisition for the uh, for the data which is on it meaning the computer is powered on and has been logged in by the suspect static acquisition are always the preferred way to collect the digital evidence because you don't want to alter it once it would be off things would change however they do have limitations in some situations such as the encrypted drive that is readable only when the computer is powered on or a computer that's accessible over the network some solutions can help decrypt the hard drive and the whole disk of the encryption such as uh, some softwares which are mentioned um, which is uh, lcom soft uh, for forensics etc but there is no guarantee that it would be 100% uh, perfect that uh, you'll be able to decrypt it 100% uh, data on the hard drive. Now there are four methods of collecting the data creating a disk to disk image uh, image file then creating a disk to disk 100% just copying the data or image file with each and everything or creating a logical disk to a disk to disk data drive if you have another hard disk connected to the same computer you are using it for the backup of it or creating a sparse data copy or a folder on which you will be copying the data um, when you are collecting the evidence now they'll explain these things in the next slides creating a disk to disk image file most common method and offers most uh, uh, the best flexibility which is available it can make more than one copy because you have multiple hard disks you are creating different images on it um, it's a bit to bit uh, replication of the original hard drive so you can run various softwares on it in order to recover the data and is compatible with many commercial forensic tools which are available in the market now creating a disk to disk image means when uh, the disk to disk image is not disk to image uh, is not possible where uh, tool limitations could be there storage uh, limitations could be there space limitations could be there or there is no connectivity directly uh, from the servers is possible um, then tools can adjust the geometric configuration tools by encase or x ways these are the two tools which are used for that now logical acquisition is collecting evidence from a large hard drive can take several hours if your time is limited consider using a logical acquisition or sparse acquisition of the data copy method a logical acquisition captures only specific files of interest to the case or specific types of files just like i told you that you'll choose which files you'll be copy sparse acquisition collect fragments of unallocated deleted data and would copy the deleted files only from those uh, affected hard drives for larger hard disks you'll be copying the psd files psd file is um, the file for microsoft outlook or ost mail files for uh, uh, if your outlook was configured using the exchange server it would have a file format of ost or the files which are there on the raid servers when creating a copy consider uh, the size of the source disk as discussed earlier that you'll have to note down that what's the size of the original hard drives what's the size um, otherwise you lose the compression and might not be useful and then the digital signature should be verified once the data is copied and when working on the larger hard drives an alternative is using a lossless compression um, if a compression or a tool that you are using uh, they uh, claims that their data remains intact only then go for compression then otherwise um, I would still uh, suggest that same thing that don't go for any compression whether you can retain the hard disk or not or determining to perform the acquisitions and where the evidence is located on the hard drive now next is the contingency plan for image acquisition I think we'll be covering it in our next lecture that's it for today